Okay, so the program yesterday was really, the emphasis was to um, get you well grounded in the radiator transport equation and Monte Carlo approaches to solving them uh, really give you a sense of um, the foundations for how Monte Carlo simulations are constructed uh, in a way such that you know that you're getting a rigorous solution to the radiator transport equation. And, and in yesterday's um, exercise, what we hope to communicate is for you to kind of experience you know, the improvement in the accuracy, the reduction of the variance of these estimators as you run more trials, um, get a sense of how you might compare the relative performance of different estimators, because some estimators will run very quickly, as you saw for analog, and at first glance, not give you great results, uh, whereas you have other estimators that at first glance, for the same number of photons, gives you much better looking results, but actually when you think about you know, putting them on an equal playing field with respect to computational efficiency, you know, these more crude methods in some cases actually have better performance than the more advanced cases. So those things are just good to, to know and bear in mind as, as you might be using Monte Carlo simulations going forward in your research. Um, today we're going to continue the radiative transport theme. And um, one thing that certainly has, one thing that has certainly changed in the field since I joined the field probably before most of you were born is that when, when I started working in the field, um, Monte Carlo was really fairly exotic because our computational power at that time uh, was not nearly as high as it is today. And so the main method for prediction and analysis of optical data were analytic methods. And even though um, you know, Monte Carlo is now even used to resolve the inverse problems by, you know, creating lookup tables and you have, and Monte Carlo is even now potentially able to resolve inverse problems. I still believe that having a good analytical foundation is, is, is very important because you can do a lot of back of the envelope calculations. Um, in certain subfields and diffuse optics, um, diffusion based solvers are still extensively used, uh, primarily in in breast imaging, brain imaging. Uh, there's a very well-established code base called NearFast, which was established, I think, through a collaboration of Dartmouth and University College London. And uh, what's wonderful, and NearFast, the engine is diffusion-based and, and enhanced diffusion-based solvers, but of course, it's all in a, in a finite element uh, const, uh, context, so you can actually do things in very complex geometries and heterogeneous tissues with very fancy sources and detector configurations. And clearly, um, those you wouldn't be able to model or calculate those, uh, uh, you know, analytically. But the emphasis today, though, I, I believe, is, is that it's useful to understand where these approximate solutions come from, um, what their limitations and uh, benefits are, because they are much more computationally tractable as compared to Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so you can understand um, you know, in what situations they can be used. And also when you do use, say, a numerical method to solve diffu diffusion-like equations, say, using NearFast, just having the intuition of knowing what these solutions should look like, you, kinda, you, can, you can kind of uh, make sure that you're getting results you can believe. Um, so. Today I'm going to focus on um, primarily internal light fields. So we discussed on Monday that you know once you have a solution to the radio transport equation, how you convert that into a metric that you're interested in is a little bit different. Whether your application is uh, more dosimetric, you're interested in actually creating some sort of temperature change or activating a photochemical compound uh, or producing fluorescence within the volume of the tissue. Um, you're doing a slightly different weighted integral of the radiance than you are th than if you're doing diagnostics. So, um, so I will be introducing, um, you know, focus focusing mostly on volumetric light fields. Towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to show the mapping between internal light fields and reflectance and transmittance because the next lecture will be given by uh, Dr. Rolf Sager, and he's going to talk about. Uh, one of the first methods that was used to determine optical properties of tissue, and these were ex situ measurements where tissue samples were excised. 
and were, uh, were measured using uh, a device called integrating spheres uh, device where you can actually measure very precisely transmission and reflectance from these excised tissue samples. And that was coupled by, with a very um, sophisticated at that time, rigorous radiator transport solver in slabs to extract optical properties. And that's what, actually, you'll get that experience this afternoon. Part of the experience this afternoon is that you're going to um, process simulated data uh, 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 from, derived from integrating spheres on two different types of samples. Uh, one that's a much high, more highly absorbing sample and one that's a much more highly scattering sample and get a sense for what the performance of this integrating sphere inverse adding doubling method is. And then we'll also have an, inverse, uh, an integrating sphere setup there. Probably four or so people could actually work on it at a given time, but you know, hopefully throughout, by the time the lab's over, everyone will have a, had an experience of getting a sense of what it's like to, to make these measurements. Um, and so, and, and that really was the, the gold standard method to extract optical properties back in the 80s and early 90s before these more sophisticated methods came about. So, um, and then Thursday and Friday, we'll be moving into the, the real diagnostic powerhouse of this course, where the first day on, on Thursday, we'll focus on spatially resolved and spatial frequency domain methods um, and understanding where the sensitivity of those um, of those systems reside and how you extract optical properties. And the final day, we'll work on temporal frequency domain and time resolved methods. Um, and so I'll be giving you kind of the platform for what the solutions um, look like, and we're going to expand on that on, on Thursday and Friday. Okay. So any questions before, any lingering questions from yesterday or um, any questions about the agenda for today? Okay. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. I really want this to be a conversation uh, rather than uh, a podium presentation, as they say. So, um, so just want to start with some teaching objectives. So <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about two um, types of approximation, one that is actually very pervasive in our field and one that's less pervasive but I think very powerful and not uh, too much more complicated than the standard diffusion equation. So I'm going to talk about the standard diffusion and what's called a delta P1 approximation. We'll learn uh, how these approximations are derived from the radio transport equation and their underlying assumptions and limitations. And so we'll derive these governing equations from the RTE. And then as you all know, what this will do, th these approximations do is that they convert this very um, daunting integral differential equation, which is the RTE, into systems of partial differential equations, which are solvable. Okay. And then once you have partial differential equations, you, I'm sure you all know, you, you need boundary conditions in order to solve these equations. So we're going to talk about how these boundary conditions are formulated uh, to solve the governing equations of the standard diffusion approximation. And we'll talk a little bit about how these boundary conditions are ac actually dealt with in Monte Carlo and how they are approximated using these diffusion uh, and delta P1 solvers. So that will give us kind of the foundation for generating solutions. And like I said, we'll focus on solutions uh, in uh, kind of very simplistic geometries. So we're going to talk about how, how um, how you configure your source, how you configure your beam, how that might impact the optical penetration depth of light and tissues. And um, optical penetration depth is something that is um, a term that's very common in our field, but I, I often think that it's not very well defined. So I will provide two, uh, two options for how you can rigorously define optical penetration depth. and um, and I will compare predictions for optical penetration depth under uh, differing circumstances, uh, comparing predictions um, made by the standard diffusion approximation, the delta P1 approximation, and compare them with Monte Carlo. Um, it's to give you a sense of where these approximations work and where they break down. I'll first do this in, um, in a planar geometry where you have a basically an infinitely broad beam irradiating a slab. And then we'll look at things like uh, impact of optical properties, impact of refractive index mismatch, and then look at finite beam diameters. And then finally, we'll end by um, moving away. All of the 
these first results will be in, in semi-infinite media where you're, you're unbounded, uh, which is something that we do often. Um, and then um, there are other situations like your fingertip where you have access to the transmitted light field. And so the question is that what happens when you have a slab or something of finite thickness? And that's relevant to your to the second lecture and your afternoon lab. And we'll show or we'll, we'll talk about how the, the relationship between the characteristics of the internal fluence rate distribution and the reflectance, absorption, and transmittance in, in these slabs and how uh, that's relevant to extracting off. Um, of course, I got to start with the RTE slide. I think by now all of you should be fairly familiar with this and comfortable with this. The, I'll just go through this very quickly. So the, the key metric here is the radiance, which is a function of space, angle, and time. Uh, on the left-hand side of the equation, we look at local rates of change, both temporally and spatially. And the spatial change is due to the flow of photons um, along a given direction omega. And so your local or spatial change, you can get through loss due to absorption or scattering um, of light. And mu t is just the sum of the absorption plus scattering. Uh, absorb, absorbed photons are gone. Scattered photons are simply directed into another direction omega prime. You have a gain term, which expresses um, first the light that's traveling in all other directions, omega prime, that then have a probability of getting scattered from omega prime into omega, which is the direction you're interested in. Um, and so this P uh, function is uh, the single scattering phase function is a probability distribution that photons will get traveled from omega prime over to omega. And of course, you've got to, um, you've got to integrate this over all solid angles to, to consider all the omega primes. And then you've got to multiply that by the local density of scatterers at that location. So this is a gain term. And then, of course, you can have a volumetric source which can emit light um, varying with, with space, varying with direction, and varying with time. Okay. So I'll just, are there any questions about this? Because this will be the starting point for OK. So what the diffusion approximation does is that, so the radiance, as you know, is, is, is giving you variation with space, angle, and time. And what it does is that, you know, we experienced in lab a little bit, right? We did a, a lab yesterday where we looked at, we compared the amount of light traveling down from a beam to the amount of light traveling up from a beam, right? And we saw that close to the surface and along the, the, the line kind of going down into the material from the beam, we had this large difference between light traveling down and light traveling up. So you can kind of get an intuitive notion that there's a strong asymmetry in the angular distribution. Well, to solve this equation, and that makes this equation very hard to solve, because in, in general, this angular distribution of light is very complicated. So what the diffusion approximation does is it says, well, I don't want to deal with these very complicated situations. Let me try and make this function in angle fairly simple. And so there's a, a series, there's a um, set of functions called the spherical harmonics, which can define any function on a unit sphere. We, um, and so there's an infinite series of these functions. We make two pretty radical assumptions on top of that. We say, number one, I'm going to assume that there, we have azimuthal symmetry. So there's no variation with phi. That means we can throw away some of the spherical harmonics and just reduce this to something called a series of Legendre polynomials, which have only variation with theta. And again, if you have a function that has azimuthal symmetry lying on a unit sphere, and you, you, can, you can express all of them through an infinite series of Legendre polynomials. We're going to say, well, we're even lazier than that. We're only going to take the first two Legendre polynomials and try to do the best we can. And that's what the diffusion approximation is. So basically, what we're doing is that we're taking this very complicated function in space, angle, and time, and we're saying that the angular distribution is the sum of two terms. One is a term that, that does not vary with angle, and that's called the fluence rate. And this I'm just depicting, OK, we have light emanating from a point, and it's essentially uniform in all directions. And of course, this is a 2D cross-section of that. It's just a unit sphere. Okay. Now, of course, this will not give you any variation 
of light throughout your medium if you just adopt this, unless you have a spatial variation of that. We need some directionality or some net flow in one direction. So how do we get a bias in this? Well, the second Legendre polynomial essentially gives you a cosine term. So we have this, um, this variable which we call j, which is called in our um, community the flux. And uh, we take a dot product with this flux with the direction of light uh, propagation. Okay, so if we consider, so this is just a cosine term, and if we assume in, in this diagram that uh, photons are traveling from left to right and defines kind of a, zero, a theta of zero, we know that cosine is essentially positive from zero to pi over two. Uh, it's negative from pi over two to three pi over two, and then positive again from three pi over two back to to two pi. And so what you introduce is that you introduce a net flow and you're adding some additional amount of light to this forward hemisphere and taking it away from this backward hemisphere. And if you take the sum of those two, you see that you have this slight bias, okay? So you have more light emanating from this point in this forward direction and less light emanating from this backward direction. And by changing the relative magnitudes of j and phi, you can alter the amount of bias you have. And actually, you can have negative values of j. So you can actually have more light coming backwards and forwards. So, so this is uh, something that is just adopted uh, by the diffusion approximation. And then the other thing we do is that uh, other thing we approximate in the radio transport equation is the single scattering phase function. And we do the exact same thing. You know, we experienced in the first day of this lecture, uh, the first day of this course, through the, the Mie simulator, that this phase function, which describes the angular redistribution of light by scatterers, can be very complicated with angle. And uh, we say, well, we're not going to deal with very complicated situations. We, again, are going to model this phase function, this angular distribution of light, which uh, that uh, upon a single scattering event is again some sort of isotropic term plus some cosine theta variation. And G here is the single scattering um, anisotropy or single scattering asymmetry coefficient. It is the mean cosine of the scattering angle. And this is a probability density function. So if you integrate this function over all four pi steradians, you'll recover the value of one because all photons must be scattered in some direction. Okay. Okay. So everybody okay with this conceptually? Okay. So what we do is that we take these two functional forms, we put this into this equation, and what happens is that, and we do appropriate integrations over all four pi solid angles, we conserve energy essentially, and that requires us to conserve both the fluence and the flux. And I won't show you all the steps. If you're interested, I can, um, I can point you to some resources. But after the substitution, we get two partial differential equations. One that gives you an interrelationship between the time derivative of the fluence, the spatial gradient of the flux, uh, the fluence, and then the source. I forgot to, I neglected to mention that we also will consider, we also have to approximate the source. The source will be re-expressed uh, re in terms of an isotropic term and a, uh, and a, and a uh, directional term, a flux term, which is uh, called Q0 and Q1 defined here. So here is just the integral of Q over all four pi solid angles, and here is the directionality of the source here, Q1. And then the second equation relates the, uh, the flux with the spatial gradient of the fluence rate and the directionality of the, um, of the source. So if I, I can then use these two equations to eliminate the flux, because the flux appears both places, and then we just get a single partial differential equation for the fluence rate um, related to the source. Okay? So let me just take you through the terms of this equation and, and um, explain them conceptually. Um, you, if, if you have a background in heat transfer or mass transfer or, or any transport phenomenon, you'll see that certain terms remind you of a diffusion equation, but it's not quite exactly a diffusion equation. So this first term 
is a, is a Laplacian. Uh, I'm just curious, does anybody in this room have a background in transport phenomena? So heat transfer, fluid mechanics? Uh, okay, right. So those of you who have some heat transfer background, you, you know that you have this classic Laplacian term in, in thermal conduction, right? And this is essentially think about fluence as your light potential instead of your energy potential, okay? So this is a classic uh, optical diffusion term. We get a term here that's not uh, present in uh, most uh, heat transfer uh, or mass transfer equations. And this is a term that represents loss of energy due to absorption. And that's clearly something that does not happen in heat transfer. What's interesting here is that the rate at which you lose light is not just proportional to your absorption coefficient. It is also dependent on your transport coefficient. Let me just remind everyone what your transport coefficient is. Your transport coefficient is just the sum of your absorption coefficient plus your reduced scattering coefficient, right? And again, the reduced scattering coefficient is, um, is mu s times one minus g, okay? And the reason why your absorption loss needs to involve mu, t, mu tr is because the amount of absorption loss you're gonna get depends on the path length that the photons um, incur within the tissue. And so the more scattering there is, the more likely you're going to have these more torturous light paths and you're going to experience more absorption loss, okay? So this accounts for that, or is meant to account for that. You'll see that in some regimes of optical properties, this works, it, it works very well. In some regimes, it does not. Um, on the right-hand side, we have two time-varying terms. We have a second derivative of the fluence with respect to time. And uh, again, I'll allude back to Monday when uh, Jonica gave his lectures on Maxwell's equations. And you'll remember that the wave equation, which um, basically looks at, uh, at uh, propagation at a fixed speed, is expressed in terms of the second time derivative of the electric field. And so in the, in the um, Maxwell's equations, you get this term one over C squared times the second derivative of the electric field with time. And the speed of light is essentially the square root of the reciprocal of this coefficient, right? The speed of light is, is essentially the square root of C squared, okay? So this gives you, is meant to, to depict a wave-like propagation of light, but you'll see that unfortunately the equivalent velocity is a little bit off. Right? If, it, if we wanted to recover the actual velocity of light, that coefficient should be one over V squared. But if you go through the, the approximations that we make here and we do this um, you know, mathematically properly, actually this diffusion equation, or really this is the P1 equation, predicts an inaccurate velocity of light. It actually predicts a velocity of light in the medium of, uh, of V over square root of three a little slower, okay? And we'll see that um, on Friday when I show you solutions to the standard diffusion equation in the time varying case. So, but we still maintain some sort of wave-like propagation characteristic. We have the second term, which is related to the first derivative with respect to time, and that's also something that's classically seen in heat transfer. Uh, usually in heat transfer, this coefficient is one over the thermal diffusivity times the second, uh, the first derivative of temperature with respect to time. And so this coefficient here is the reciprocal of what we call the optical diffusivity, okay? And then we have a source term, just like a volumetric source term like we have in, um, in, in most transport um, heat or mass transfer equations. So that's why you hear this term, the diffusion approximation, because a lot of the terms in this equation remind one of a diffusion process but with a couple of terms that don't uh, occur. Now, um, in the case of um, steady state um, light propagation where we're not considering time variation, the diffusion approximation and the P1 approximation are exactly the same. That terminology is interchangeable. In the time varying case, the diffusion approximation uh, doesn't uh, consider this wave-like propagation. So the P1 approximation includes this wave-like propagation, and, uh, but the diffusion approximation gets, gets rid of that second, second derivative with respect to time. And, um, and typically, the, the, 
um, understanding is, is that these equations are typically valid when scattering is much more strongly um, dominant over mu a, although that wasn't a, a priori assumption that's made in making this analysis. But the reason why this is stated is that we need to have an angular distribution of light that is not strongly varying with angle, and the only way you're going to get that is that there's enough scattering to randomize the direction so that you don't have a strong angular variation. And of course, that's going to fail uh, when you have collimated beams and there's not enough scattering, and it's also just going to be there when you're, when you're in spatial locations close to sources and close to boundaries, as we discussed on, on, on Monday. The other thing I want to emphasize is that you see here that the only optical coefficients you have are mu a, mu tr, which is the sum of mu a and mu s prime, and mu s prime by itself. So um, the phase function is no, nowhere to be found in this equation. And even the most simplistic metric uh, relating the, the shape of the phase function, g, is not, um, does not appear independently in this equation. g is always embedded in mu s prime. And what that means is that the standard diffusion approximation will give you the same prediction for all pairs of mu s and g that result in the same mu s prime value. So if you have a scattering coefficient of one and a g equals zero, and you put those into this equation, and you have another situation where you have mu s of 10 and a g of 0.9, standard diffusion will give you the same answer, okay? And that's good when, you, when you're far away from the source, but it's gonna break down when you're close to the source, or for those of you who are doing spatial frequency domain, if you're looking at high spatial frequencies, you're gonna start seeing uh, you're going to start seeing problems because your your detected light field is actually actually sensitive to to those phase function metrics, phase function differences. Okay, so um, let me pause here and just see if there are any questions. So just want to remind you of a couple things I think I remember saying in um, the first lecture on Monday is that, uh, of course, diffusion approximation and P1 approximation are, are part of this um, range of methods or range of approximations from the spherical harmonics. Uh, it's P1 because we actually, um, uh, we truncate at the first order Legendre polynomial term, uh, Legendre polynomial, and it results in n plus one equations. So we had two partial differential equations which we could then combine uh, to reduce to one. So that's the, the P1 approximation just refers to the uh, first order Legendre polynomial. But you can improve the accuracy of these by taking, say, the P2 or P3 or P4 or P5, where you introduce more complexity or you admit more complexity to uh, your ability to fit these functions on a unit sphere. Sean. Uh, not a question for me, but I just remember that learning this yeah. took a lot of exposure, and uh, sometimes you don't have a real handle on it, but that doesn't leave you with any specific questions. Yeah. So I was just wondering if maybe anyone would like a part of it explained again, or, you know, if... Or Sean, do you recall any questions that you had or any statement that was made that clarified things for you? So for me, I think it was really just repeated exposure yeah. because there was a lot up there where I could kind of grasp the math but not really have an intuitive understanding of what each term meant, sure. you know, uh, uh, physically and biologically. So, uh, you know, for me, that was, yeah. that was the real disconnect. But just, you know, in case anybody doesn't get it, please speak up. Yeah. The other thing um, I remember when I was first looking and I made this, this aha moment of why this approximation can be really bad. And, and remember, we're typically thinking about, oh, the Gs in tissue are fairly high. They're like 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Well, let's look at this phase function equation here. If we put in um, a value of 0.8 or 0.9, um, or we look at 
this dot product of omega dot omega prime, okay? Remember, that's a cosine variation. It takes on values between zero, but between minus one and one. Probability density functions should never be negative. They should always be positive, right? At worst, you should have zero probability of a certain event occurring. This function actually takes on negative values for any g larger than 0.34 or 33, right? There is going to be some range of angles where you actually have a negative probability. That's completely nonsensical, right? So you can see that this probably doesn't do a very good job for g is larger than about 0.3 or 0.4. So that kind of gives you some sort of sense of perhaps some, some degree of, of, of difficulty. Yes? Yes, close to the source is not good. I guess the G's aren't, oh. So are the other, I was just asking, what are the other limitations with approximation? I think those are pretty much it. We're gonna, see, we're gonna see in some results later on where this fails uh, okay. and under what conditions this fails. Okay. Um, you just have to think about what physical processes can give rise to an angular distribution of light that is not going to be well approximated by a simple uniform constant with angle plus a cosine theta. And you're locked into a ratio between these two in order to conserve energy. Okay. I don't know. So um, I guess along similar lines, just to reiterate the assumptions of this model. So you were saying that you assume that it's uh, symmetric around the azimuthal angle. Um, were there any other assumptions that go along with this? So of course you're only taking the first two terms. So um, I guess can you does this allow you to account for multiple scattering events? Does that assumption then translate to any you know additional scattering events past the first scattering event? So this, this admits, remember, we're taking these two functional forms of the radians and the phase function, and we're substituting it into the radio transport equation. So the radio transport equation accounts for multiple scattering. Okay. What we're doing is that we're just limiting the functional form of the radians and the phase function. So the, all of this, um, yeah, all of the processes that are, um, expressed by the radio transport equation, we still do, but we're just restricting it based on a very simplistic form of both the radians and the phase function. And the source. Sean? Yeah, can I just uh, add to that a little bit? So as far as like multiple scattering events, stuff at this scale isn't really dealing with like a, you know quantum phenomenon like an individual photon having that you know jointed chain kind of path. We're here, you know, we're zoomed out and we're going to get things that are, are very nice, continuous, uh, differentiable paths. Like, you know, everything is really smooth and it's not an individual photon. It's just like a rate of fluence at any given point in any direction rather than, you know, going really down. So if, if you remember on the first lecture, there was a slide about different methods for different spatial scales. And this is in like the meso or like the upper end of the meso scale. So you can't really think of it too much as like, oh, where does, you know, one individual photon go? Unless Fossen wants to correct me. So isn't the source detector separation also important when it comes to diffusion approximation? Right. So, so here we're not talking about, so the question was, you know, source detector separation. So right now our focus is on the internal radians and, of course, source detector separation, you start to look at the reflectance. Mm -hmm. um, so um, source detector separation is important. Um, so again, when your separation between the source and the detector is small, you're close to the source. Right, yeah, that's where this, this field so starts to so break down. And actually, yeah, that connects. what happens is, is that, so let's think about this a little further. So. Um, if you're able to measure, um, so this actually <coughs> pairs well with the um, next lecture, but back in the day where we actually didn't know um, what phase functions look like in tissue, you did this, people did this very, very difficult measurement 
which they took a very small slice of tissue with a characteristic uh, thickness of 1 over mu sub s. So on the order of 10 microns. They, sh they shone a light in this direction, and then they had a detector that, that uh, could swing on an arm. And they looked at the detected scattered light at multiple angles. They did this goniometric measurement of what is the angle. And so here, since the thickness of this tissue is small, you will at most have one scattering event, probably in that, in, in that uh, slab. And you'll have lots of, potentially lots of structure in the detected signal. So you'll measure some sort of detected signal intensity versus theta, and you know, you'll get you know, you'll get some, you know, whatever, you know, you may look at something like this. Um, so the reason why I mention this is that if your source, if your detector is close to your source, mm -hmm. much of the light that you're c capturing has undergone one, two, three, maybe ten scattering events. Mm -hmm. In which case you haven't fully randomized the light yes, field. And right. therefore you become sensitive mm -hmm. to the structure of this phase function. Right? right. So whether... Your your phase function looks like this, or your phase function looks like you know, like this. Um, when you're far away from 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 the source, because you get so much multiple scattering, you you're not sensitive to that difference. But right close to the source, you are. It's very sensitive, yeah. right? Or at high yeah. spatial frequencies. For those of you mm -hmm. as a PI, I know uh, Chad Canick, who used to be at Dartmouth, did a lot of work at at very high spatial frequencies, trying to get at this microscopic morphology within tissues because that is, you know, the changes in microscopic morphology impact the phase function. Does that address you? Yeah, thank you. More than just, you know, seeing that the terms are similar to, you know, thermal or mass diffusion, yeah. Yeah. You, we can really think about this as sort of a directional Brownian motion of photons. Is that correct to say? Well, it's a little different because you have absorption loss. Sure, but right? so just the movement though of the field, can it? Can we sort of just conceptually think about it that in a similar way? Similarly, okay. Loss. Okay. Yeah. So right. So that's a big thing. So this equation again, I'm going to be a little stickler for the math, but the, you're going to wear me down. I'm going to tell you what I really think. So. Uh, <laughs> This is not a diffusion equation, okay? Because this is something probably Sean. Do you know what what type of equation this is? So this I mean, is a so Helmholtz call it reaction diffusion. This is a Helmholtz equation, okay? Um, because it has a wave propagation term, it has absorption loss term. So, um, and you have a completely different set of of ways to solve this equation, which are very different from a diffusion equation. Um, so, directional bound Brownian motion. Well, you know, you can argue that if you had a perfectly isotropic phase function then there's no directionality, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's basically Brownian motion, but it's still not Brownian motion because you still have this wavelength propagation term and you still have this absorption loss. So that's why okay. I'm not going to agree with you okay. as much as I would like to. <laughs> A lot. So, so in, like in transport, um, there are like, I don't know, there are different like dimensionless numbers yes. that you can use to yeah. kind of make things make these approximations. Yeah. Do you apply any dimensionless numbers here as well? Yeah, so we can have a long conversation because I've done a lot of this analysis in completely a non-dimensional framework. Um, but that framework doesn't resonate with our biomedical optics community. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, you know, yeah, you can think of these things in terms of albedo and reduced albedo. So you can, you can rescale all of your um, optical coefficients from zero to one. So you can, yeah, albedo is a classic measure in, in, in optical um, and atmospheric physics where you basically look at mu a, uh, mu s over the ratio of mu a plus mu s. So this basically takes on values from zero, where there's no scattering and there's only absorption, and takes on a value of one, where you know there's all scattering and no absorption. And so this will work best in the limit as albedo going towards one. And we'll see that soon uh, in some results. So I think let's just keep on moving forward. I think a lot of these questions may reappear, but I think 
we'll have specific situations in which to talk about. So, so good. So now I want to introduce this, um, this variant on the diffusion approximation, which is certainly in the literature, but not uh, employed as much as I would like. But before we go there, let me just um, give you some solutions to this equation in two kind of classic textbook cases. One is if you have a point source embedded in an infinite geometry, you know, so the classic put a fiber optic in a big vat of intralipid and look at the diffusion of light. So here is the fluence rate as a function of space and time. And again, actually, if you get rid of this term, this is exactly what a, points, a point thermal source uh, looks like in, um, in thermal diffusion. But you have this absorption loss term. So essentially, you have, um, you have a prefactor to this exponential loss with both space and time, and this term here uh, is linked to um, the path length. V times T is the path length of the, of the light and multiplied by mu A, so you have like a, a Beer's law influence. You can integrate this function over all time and get kind of a, a steady state um, a solution, and you can do similar things with the planar geometry. One thing I want to emphasize here is this parameter called mu effective. So, the diffusion process gives you a natural, uh, a natural decay rate, which is linked directly to this coefficient for absorption loss. So let's just pretend that the right-hand side of this whole equation is zero, OK? Do people remember what ordinary difference? And let's assume we have one dimension. So say we have an equation like this. Only a function of z equals 0. Does anybody know what the solution for this equation is? Don't worry about the boundary conditions. What's the general solution for a second derivative minus the actual function equaling 0? So what, what, um, what function? has a second derivative equal to itself. It's exponential, right? So here you'll, and the exponential will end up having a, a coefficient. Let me just replace this by some value alpha. The exponential will be minus alpha, minus square root of alpha z. But we, so the square root of this is something I shouldn't have used alpha, I should call it because this is actually mu effective squared. Okay. So mu effective, which is something that in our field, if you read the literature, a lot of people say the optical penetration depth of light is 1 over mu effective. And uh, I'll have some choice words about that statement in a little while. But, um, but um, this gives you a natural. Um, spatial decay of light in the diffusion in the diffuse regime. Of course, the spatial decay of light will also uh, uh, be affected by the spatial decay of your source. Okay. So, um, so we'll we'll um, we'll talk about these these solutions uh, more, uh, and I can certainly give you the source from which uh, from which these uh, equations can be derived. Okay. So let's talk about um, another variant of this approximation called the delta P1. And so um, true to its name, it, it's similar to the P1 approximation, but it adds a delta function to it. And the reason why we're interested in adding a delta function is that we've seen uh, that tissues are highly forward scattered, right? We, we looked at phase functions for me scatterers, and we see this huge forward peak, like most of the photons essentially move directly forward through the scatter, or maybe get deflected a slight, a slight amount. And, um, and we know that just using a cosine theta variation doesn't give you much of a bias. So why don't we relieve the wor all of the work that the cosine theta function have to, has to do and relieve some of that by just dumping some of the light directly forward? So let's, let's see how this works. So 
what I've done here is that I've written the radiative transport equation, but explicitly put in the, the phase function that we use for the standard diffusion approximation. And that's something called the Eddington phase function, which uh, I forgot to point that out. So this is, this is the, what's called an Eddington phase function. Eddington was a, a famous person, and Sir Arthur Eddington, who's a cosmologist, I believe, did a lot of work in atmospheric physics. So essentially, I'm just writing the radiative transport equation with this phase function explicitly, um, explicitly in that equation. And what we're going to say is this, is that, you know, in these single scattering events, there's a, a good fraction of light that doesn't really get deflected that much that just stays collimated. So upon each interaction, I will say that there's going to be a portion of the radiance that gets scattered and becomes diffuse, but there's some that just stays in the original direction omega naught and remains collimated, okay? And in a similar way, I'm going to say in your single scattering phase function, there's going to be a fraction of the light that gets uh, scattered directly forward. There's no change in direction. This is a direct delta function. It takes on a finite value only when the, the argument is zero. So when omega dot omega naught, um, basically your direction of propagation is the same as the direction of collimation, this will be one and then you'll pull off the and the delta function will give you, uh, will give you uh, one times two f. And then the remaining fraction gets scattered, okay? So now in order to conserve, in order for this to be a probability density function, it has to integrate to one over all angles. And so what happens is that the single scattering anisotropy here uh, will be, uh, will be a smaller value compared to the G in the Eddington phase function because you've relieved some of the anisotropy from the delta function, using the delta function, okay? And so if you now plug these th things into the radiative transport equation, you'll get a radiative transport equation with the delta P1 phase function, and it's the same equation except that your coefficients are slightly modified. So your mu t gets modified by something called mu t star. Mu s is replaced by mu s star. And your Eddington phase function is the same Eddington phase function, but it has a reduced value of g. It becomes g star. OK, so what are these different uh, coefficients? Well, the um, mu s star is a modified reduced scattering coefficient. So um, it is essentially mu s times one minus the fraction of the light that gets scattered directly forward. So it's not all the light gets scattered, only the fraction of the light that we allow to get scattered um, is interacting in a scattering way. This ends up being, if you go through the mathematics, mu s times not one minus g, but one minus the second moment of the phase function. The second moment of any function is the variance of the function. So this tells, so if, if you have a standard deviation, so if you have a phase function and it's forward peaked, it'll look something like this. It'll have some sort of standard deviation, right? So what we're saying is, is that we're gonna let all the light that's within the standard deviation not get scattered. Let that go directly forward doesn't deviate that much. And all the stuff outside the standard deviation effectively gets scattered, okay? So we let the stuff in a narrow band around the peak stay collimated. We let the rest of the stuff scatter, okay? And then if you go through the mathematics, there's a, a reduction of the G that's used in the Eddington phase function that becomes G star, which is actually the first moment of the phase function, G, I just call it G1, not to get confused with G2, G1 divide, divide by G1 plus one. And so this becomes actually much smaller. Uh, so like a G of 0.9 essentially becomes a G of around 0.5, okay. So what, how this helps is that it actually relieves the asymmetry that has to be accommodated uh, both by the phase function and also relieves the asymmetry that you have to uh, have in the diffuse 
uh, in the diffuse light, uh, uh, diffuse radiance, because you allow for collimation. So this is an equation that will satisfy uh, the scattered light. You'll get another equation, which looks actually identical to the standard diffusion approximation, but you'll have a modified source term. And surprisingly, this small accommodation, which only describes the diffuse light, we have to add back the collimated light, will provide much more, um, much more accurate uh, distributions, as we'll see. And the other thing we see is that we have the appearance of both mu s prime, which appears in mu t r, and mu s star. And remember, mu s star is related to the second moment of the phase function. So this modified approximation actually gives results that are sensitive to the first two moments of the phase function. So you won't get the same result using delta P1 if you use different values of G for the same value of mu s prime, okay? And yet there's really no added computational complexity. The governing equation is the same, it's just the coefficients are different. Any questions about that? Okay. So let's talk about boundary conditions. Um, because in order to solve these equations, we need boundary conditions. So I just want uh, to remind you that, um, you know, we, we know about the physics of Fresnel reflectance and transmission at boundaries. The most common situation we're faced with is this issue of where we have a, a slab of tissue uh, opposed to an error interface, and that essentially there are functions that describe uh, the amount of light that gets transmitted uh, at this boundary or gets totally internally reflected from this boundary that's based on the refractive index mismatch. You all know this uh, from high school, you know, Snell's law, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. Once you approach this critical angle, uh, light can no longer come out and is totally internally reflected. So, um, so just analytically, this shows you what these equations look like. So the green line is just for an N uh, equals 1.4 medium, which we often use for tissue. This tells you for a given angle of incidence what the angle of transmission will be. And the critical angle is a little bit over 45 degrees for this refractive index mismatch. So there's uh, the relationship between the incident and uh, transmitted angle. And then the red line tells you how much gets reflected for the various angles of incidence and how much is transmitted. And actually it's a fairly smooth and not very strongly varying function until you get to about 35, 40 degrees and then you get a rapid change. Okay. Now in Monte Carlo, um, this can be treated in, uh, in many ways, but the two most common ways um, are um, methods of photon splitting and roulette. So the first thing I want to establish is that Monte Carlo handles the boundary condition rigorously. So if you have, um, say, an event where the photon, a single photon is scattered and is traveling towards the surface and impinges on the surface, uh, you know the angle of incidence. And from the Fresnel reflectance equations, you know what the, what the amount of internal reflection should be and what the balance for transmission should be. You can do two things. One, you can say, okay, let me, let me uh, split the photon into two photons. Let um, the amount that should be reflected be internally reflected uh, and continue its trajectory, but I will decrement the weight from W to the Fresnel reflectance times W, which is the portion of the light that's reflected. And then that can continue on its merry way and interact with the tissue again. And the balance of it, I'll allow it to be transmitted. And if there's a detector here and needs to be tallied, you can tally it there. Or if you don't want to split the photon into two photons, you can say, well, let me just r run a roulette. I select a number at random, uniformly distributed between zero and one. And if that number comes back between zero and the actual value of the reflectance for that angle, of Fresnel reflectance for that angle, I will uh, reflect it. If it takes on a value between the Fresnel reflectance and one, I will transmit it, okay? I allow only one or the other outcome. And over, 
you know, many thousands of trials, both of these methods um, give you the same solution. Okay. Um, they just have slightly different convergence characteristics. Um, so, but the, the key thing here is that Monte Carlo handles this rigorously on, a, on an angle by angle basis. The diffusion and delta P1 approximation can't do that because it doesn't do an angle by angle balance. It, um, how we handle this is through um, a hemispherical balance. So what we say is this, is that if you're at this location very close to the surface, just below the surface, I'll call that Z equals zero plus a little, a little distance, very, very small, infinitesimally small distance, all of the light that is coming down, so z dot omega greater than zero is positive for all light coming down. The light that comes down from this interface has to essentially equal the amount of light that was traveling upward. So we're now we're looking at photon propagation directions dotted with z that is less than zero. It, the light coming down has to be equal to the light that was traveling up that got reflected back down. Okay, and then all I do is that I have my um, two terms of our, our two Legendre polynomials, the isotropic and first order anisotropic terms. I put that into these equations and I do the solid angle integrals and I get my boundary condition. Okay, and this is also, a, a, um, it's called a mixed condition. You're, you're sensitive to both the, the fluence rate and the spatial gradient of the fluence rate and this can be computed. So the key thing here is that we can't do a detailed balance. We have to do a hemispherical balance. Okay. And then the other thing I want to just uh, mention here is that there, the presence of this refractive index mismatch gives you a discontinuity in your radiance across this boundary because what happens is that any cone of light that has an angular interval of theta incident gets mapped onto a a, a distinctly different angular cone of light that's given by omega transmitted. And given that not all the light comes out, there's going to be a different amount of light uh, coming out than it, it resides right below the surface. So there's actually a discontinuity in your radiance. This equation maps the radiance distribution for z values just outside of the slab in air and it relates it to the amount of light that's just inside the tissue. So this is a key relationship that you have to use in order to get reflectance. And the reflectance is just the integral of this radiance over all solid angles traveling upwards. So these equations are very important to relate the internal fluence or the internal radiance distribution to the external radiance distribution. And this equation allows you to calculate the reflectance from that radiance distribution or if you're on the other side, you can construct a similar equation to get transmittance, okay? And since I'll be showing you reflectance and transmittance uh, predictions, I wanted to show you where, what computation was done. Okay, so now let's go to results. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, I'm gonna focus mo mostly on, on dosimetry, internal light fields. Um, there are, I think, three general kind of beams of interest one can consider. One is kind of a, a beam of very narrow spatial extent, uh, which generates an internal um, fluence distribution. Um, and here you can imagine what the fluence distribution might look like along the center line of this beam. Uh, you can think of a beam of finite extent, maybe with a Gaussian distribution with some characteristic diameter, two times R naught or radius, um, or you can consider a planar beam, which is essentially a beam of, of infinite extent laterally, and you have a planar penetration. I want to define two distinctly different penetration depths, uh, either of which might be more pertinent to your application. So there's some applications where you want to, say, photoactivate a compound, and that activation can only occur if you have a certain intensity of light. So you may want to know at what location does your intensity of light drop from a, to a certain fraction relative to your incident intensity. So this is something I, which I call penetration depth. And I'm just going to use the metric of at what point does the incident light drop uh, by 1 over E of my incident light. 
I'm going to call this uh, pi. Uh, I'm going to express this in dimensionless form, uh, since I heard Milan wanted dimensionless coordinates. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I adopted a dimensionless um, method for, for depths in just a second. There's another consideration which may be distinctly different. Say you're doing therapy and you want to achieve a certain, you want to know where, where is most of my light absorbed? And here, you're not interested in achieving a specific value of intensity. You're trying to figure out where was most of my energy absorbed. So there, you want to take the integral of this distribution and see where is most of my light absorbed. Here, I'm just going to, again, choose all but 1 over E. So at what depth is roughly 63% of my light absorbed? I'm going to call this a dose depth. You know, where does most of my optical dose reside in the tissue? We're going to call that delta. Okay, and these metrics uh, of pi and, and and delta really allow you to evaluate the spatial extent and the penetration depth of these distributions and their va variation with optical properties and beam properties. So um, the thing that's important here is that you know I just mentioned that this value of one over mu effective governs this decay of light in the tissue. But it is also sensitive to how the source decays. And it turns out that in the standard diffusion approximation, the source decays according to 1 over the transport coefficient. So this is a reciprocal of this length scale is, is uh, called the transport coefficient. And it gives you the characteristic length scale that light will absorb or isotropically scatter in the tissue. So that is another important length scale in the standard diffusion approximation. In the delta P1, it's slightly different because what we do is that we allow a lot of the light that stays within the standard deviation of the phase function not to get scattered, to con continue directly forward. And it's the light that comes, uh, that is larger than this variance to scatter. And that gives you, gives rise to a different decay term, a mu T star in your collimated view. Okay, so now let's look at some results. So let's first look at planar irradiation. Um, what I'm plotting on the y-axis is the fluence rate relative to the incident fluence rate, which is 1. I'm plotting the depth in a normalized um, uh, coordinate. I'm actually normalizing the depth relative to the transport mean free path. And basically, the reciprocal of mu tr is the transport mean free path. Okay. And, um, and then I'm looking at this for different ratios of scattering to absorption. So here's a strongly scattering situation, a little less strongly scattering situation, increasing absorption higher and higher. The symbols here are Monte Carlo simulations. So this is a gold standard. And you can see by the smoothness of these uh, results that the variance in these results are very small. In all of these cases, the variance is smaller than the symbol size. And here I'm looking at a case where there's no refractive index mismatch between the medium, uh, between the tissue and the surrounding medium. So kind of mimicking, say I submerged my tissue in an aqueous bath, and it's basically this refractive index match, or you put some sort of uh, matching oil between your detector and your tissue. So this is what, um, what the results look like. Um, you see that there's a stronger spatial decay as you increase absorption. Um, which is not surprising. Um, and what's also interesting is that for high scattering, you actually see that the maximum fluence rate is not at the surface, it's slightly beneath the surface. Can it, anybody um, rationalize why that might be the case? Why might your peak fluence rate occur below the surface instead of at the surface? So here we have a planar beam. So there's no, there's no region where you have a beam and then adjacent regions where you don't have a beam. You have a beam, you have a beam everywhere. Um, but you're, you're hitting on, you're, you're very close. So here, for highly scattering um, situations, you have a lot of backscattered light. So actually, you're losing 
a fair bit of light out from the tissue into the air. And so you kind of have an optical flux of light flowing out of the tissue. And kind of like you have a temperature gradient gives rise to a heat flux, a fluence gradient gives rise to an optical flux across the boundary. So that's a, a key consideration. Okay. So if I were to take this piece of tissue out into the air, how do you think these fluence rate plots would change? So let's just think at the surface. Will it be easier or harder? Oh, sorry, did you have your hand up? Tom? Yeah. You're losing less to the surface, and so you probably see your highest fluence rate at zero depth or closer. Let's here. let's not worry about shape. I, I want to know. Let, we'll get to shape in just a second. Let's just first, and you'll be able to answer this question. So if I put this at n equals 1.4, will that curve be higher or lower than this curve for n equals 1.0? Will I have more light or less light within the tissue? That's right. We'll have more light because you'll have internal reflection. And then the shape, you're thinking that you'll have less of a, a subsurface peak. So both of you are correct, right? So first, you have you trap more light in the tissue because you have some angles where the light can't escape. And also because the light can't escape uh, as easily, you're not going to have as much of a subsurface peak. Very good. And then the difference between the n equals 1.0 and the 1.4 case gets reduced as your absorption gets higher because you have less light escaping, less backscattered light generally. So it's, I think it's really good for people to build this intuition uh, because um, if you measure these signals, you want to make sure that they're matching you know, the common sense. So let's look at what the standard diffusion approximation gives us for all of these uh, results. Um, the solid lines are the index matched condition. The dotted uh, curves are the mismatched condition. And so you start to see um, all of the things I've been telling you about. One is that standard diffusion approximation tends to work well for highly scattered uh, scattering media. And you do see that in a relative sense, that clearly the curves far at larger depths, depths larger than, say, 2 to 3 L star, you're getting pretty good estimates. Once you get within 2 or 3 L star of the surface, this is a log plot. So just notice that even when you're off by this much, it could be a pretty so once you get within about two and a half L star, your, your predictions can be very high. Um, but you actually see that the slope, the decay, the spatial decay of the standard diffusion approximation is giving you pretty good results for the highly scattered You start to see that slope actually start to get worse, even where your scattering is too
I just didn't have a good understanding of what tissues are the different US-UA ratios. Okay. I was curious if you could okay, so give us some examples. Mu's prime and mu ratios are, are um, basically, I think I would think of this more in terms of at what wavelengths, mm -hmm. right? So in the, so I would say, say breast tissue in the, in the red,
So we did a lot, right? So we, we went through a pretty math-heavy beginning to, to introduce these standard diffusion and delta P1 approximations. I emphasize the fact that Monte Carlo really does this boundary condition rigorously by doing a detailed angular balance. I showed you how diffusion and delta P1 does these hemispheric balances uh, that aren't perfect, and you definitely saw those in the results for the fluence rates versus, uh, versus uh, depth in these slabs. We showed the failure of standard diffusion at superficial depths and for more strongly absorbing um, samples. We showed that delta P1 um, is, is, um, is magical. Um, it, it provides significant improvements even though the complexity is not is, is, is basically the same. And then we talk about finite. I mean, we published um, the first paper where we looked at internal light fields and we showed the penetration depths and we actually published a subsequent paper where we actually show improved spatially resolved reflectance using delta P1 and actually are able to extract G uh, from spatially resolved. So, um, no, I think, I think it can be used. I mean, I think to some degree, um, at least from the diagnostic point of view, the analytic approximations have been superseded by Monte Carlo lookup tables, which I think are now pretty pervasive in the field. Although I don't know how much traction, uh, how much interest there is in extracting parameters of the phase function. I know there's some groups that are looking at doing that using SFDI. Um, you know, and, and the center of gravity of the field in some sense is focused more on diagnostics than therapy. Uh, I think perhaps the real strength of the delta P1 is in internal dosimetric evaluation. Uh, but in those situations, often you have very customized geometries, in which case that perhaps doing an analytic approximation with you know, a point source or a planar source or a cylindrical source is, is fine to make estimations, but not good enough to actually do, to do full dissymmetry planning, in, in which case you probably want to do some sort of finite element model. Um, and I think NearFast, for instance, has higher order it's not limited to P1, I think you can do P3, P5, P7, and near fast. And so once you do that, then, you know, you know those are going to perform. If you go to high enough P, PN values, that's going to outperform delta P1. So I think it really resides in simplicity. And if you want to do some quick and dirty calculations, I certainly would always use delta P1 as opposed to SDA. But whether that's going to be good enough for the final you know, complete calculation, probably you'll have to go to a finite element model or a COMSOL, you know, all of these, um, these more sophisticated solvers for complex geometries. Does that address? Okay. But if you're interested, we can certainly chat. Any other questions?